This week's episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 30th of March 2022 at home in Wicklow. And it is a topical episode which focuses on the, the widely reported Hollywood incident from last weekend where, which saw Will Smith, the actor walking up on stage and slapping hard across the face the comedian Chris Rock after Rock had made what was frankly a very weak joke about Will Smith's wife, Jada Pinkett Smith, and her shaved head, which is attributed to alopecia. Um, it was an extraordinary moment in the, uh, in the history of the Oscars, which, which as a child I used to love, you know, very much um, a part of my my love of movies. I was fascinated by Oscar winners, and indeed I had a lovely little hardback book that had been presented to me at the end of primary school by my teacher. It was a fact finder. It was full of general knowledge, but there was one double page spread, which was dedicated to uh, listing the. Oscar winners from when the Oscars started uh, until that moment in time, which I think it went to like 1984, or 85, perhaps. And it was a list of the best movies, best movie winners and best actress winners and best actor winners. And I used to religiously tick off the movies that I managed to see on TV. And for many years, I was a keen Oscar Awards watcher um, but that ended at some point and I started to realise that the Oscars rarely reflect the best movies that have been made and there's all kinds of agendas and politics uh, involved but there you go anyway um, so this was a, a shocking moment and so I'm you know like many people I found myself reflecting on it because um, I'm interested in the movies and um, I just wanted to spend quite a bit of time in this episode talking about you know different ways to to view the incident and to put it into a context of hollywood celebrity lifestyle and to unpack some of the implications and to look at some of the the responses which fall into um you know larger and topical discussions about violence and sexism um uh and all that kind of thing and i kind of bring it to my own sort of you know conclusion and I also throw into the mix um, the, an idea that my, my cousin here at Hashtag Blessed presented me with, the idea of one being one's own diagnostic tool in our quest for wellness. And I circle that back to Will Smith and Hollywood and sure, how would anybody be well in that mad old world of the movies and Hollywood in particular. So um, yeah, so that's what's coming up in this week's episode. Um, and I had there's a, you know within within that conversation within that discussion, there's also a bit of an analysis of the slap and what a slap can represent. And I didn't even go to the the sexy place with slaps, um, but there you go. I just I flowed and I flowed. And then I had flown and certain things were dropped. So be it. Okay, so that's what's coming up. I'll see you there real soon. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Leaving the dream behind. Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to The Clear Out. You're very welcome. How does today find you? I'm sitting here drinking a lovely cup of tea. Now... Was it last night or this morning? Life, life, life is a blur. Or else I'm just getting old. I'm get, I am. I'm getting old. And I'm getting a little bit senile. And I shouldn't make jokes about such things because we all now know the consequences of a joke that doesn't go go well. I'm going to return to that in some detail. Uh, <laughs> but I did. I had this <laughs> ridiculous moment at the weekend. I am. Um, I was writing something in my in my diary, dear diary. 
I had a funny feeling in my tummy today. I was, I don't know what I was writing, just, um, you know, putting down an appointment or uh, a karate class detail or something. Anyway, I noticed I'd written down it was a friend's birthday. So I instantly texted my friend. I know he's been going through some stuff in his family. So I, I sent out a very sincere message to him. And a little bit later on, he said, um, thanks very much. Uh, you know, you know, my birthday was a month ago. And I was like, yeah, I did know that. And I kind of scrolled back through our our text thread and I had actually sent him <laughs> a nice birthday message on his actual birthday, which I had also written in my diary for the correct day a month earlier. Um, but it was just bizarre. It was one of those, what he- what why did I even write it down in you know a month later having already recorded it anyway it felt it felt very bizarre or zarbi as some Parisians like to say is that an exclusively um Parisian habit or is it across certain parts of France where they play around with the uh, the words I, I I can't remember what they call it it's it's a little little bit like uh Ucle in the Ag Bay, look in the bag. I don't even know what that's called. There's a name for those things, but the French have their own version. So instead of C'est bizarre, you can say C'est Um if you if you choose. If you choose. Uh, anyway, so that was that was a bit of a that was a bit of a senior moment. Um and in all seriousness I'm not really concerned. It's just amazing. It really, how I think of it is, other things just occupy that present focus of your brain, and it's like there's this kind of push for attention all the time, and things get knocked around, and it's like you can't, <laughs> you just can't keep track of what you have and haven't done, um, and other things just hold focus, and the days just keep coming round and the hours and the minutes and the seconds and you're there and it's like what the hell was I thinking about talking about doing aspiring to do hoping to do regretting hating resenting whatever anyway yesterday last night maybe it was last night (laughs) last night or this morning my wife was placing the the herbal tea bags into their own container so it was a little selection of nice herbal teas in the garden in in the garden in the kitchen and (laughs) i'm all over the place and you know you know you know how those tea bags come they're individually wrapped in their nice little sachets so she put them all in their own container um on display beside the kettle with the other you know tea and coffee and it's just lovely it's just lovely. So what did I do? I went to make myself a cup of tea. It's a little bit chilly today and hashtag blessed. Colder weather is coming. Everyone keeps telling me there's snow on the way. After unprecedented lovely weather over the last week, we had an amazing spell of sunny days, warm days, a day you'd happily take in the middle of summer um, and not in the uh, kind of middle of spring as it is. So anyway, I went for my cup of tea there. thought I'll have a cup of tea when I'm recording the podcast today. And what did I reach for? One of the nice herbals? No, I went straight for the lions. I went straight for the lions, the old traditional. The two big tea brands, the traditional tea brands in Ireland are lions, that's spelled with a Y, and berries. And uh, always been a lions man myself. I'm sure I've covered this fascinating territory before. This fascinating, gripping terrain what kind of tea does Dara like? I like the old lions. Um, yeah, so there you go. Lions, beautiful. Sometimes, do you know? Do you know what my theory is? Do you know? Do you know what my theory is about the best cup of tea, the nicest cup of tea, the loveliest cup of tea. The best cup of tea is the one you don't have time to finish. Have you ever noticed that? You get it just right, the, just the right strength, just the right heat, just the right amount of milk if, you, if you're a milk taker. Don't take the milk. And it's just lovely, but you're on the clock and you can't finish it. That's the nicest cup of tea. 
because otherwise you're sitting there a bit too long and it gets a bit cold and you know it's it, it, that, that sort of tepid not quite hot enough final gulp no not so good but the one you don't have time to finish that's usually the nicest cup of tea right there's my little piece of wisdom okay okay thanks for listening talk to you next week (laughs) ah good luck um so i realize i realize i i am not in the habit of explaining what the podcast is about and this is this is episode 45 so i'm closing in i'm closing in over the next kind of month and a half i'm closing in on um a year of doing the podcast and i've managed to produce an episode once a week like clockwork um and i realize apart from the the opening the the you know the 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 debut episode the first episode which was called what the hell are we listening to um i've never i I don't often repeat the sort of the mission statement of the podcast and so if someone's dropping you know listening for the first time they're like i really i mean apart from reading the description they don't really know like i'm not saying well this is the general thrust of the podcast so i'm going to try and get back back i'm going to try and establish the habit of just a little boof about the podcast at the start of the episode and it's not the start of the episode really i'm seven and a half minutes in but I will just say, what is the podcast about? The podcast is an offshoot of my website, theclearout.com, which I started nine years ago. And on that, well, a blog. I say website because it sounds fancier than a blog. And on theclearout.com, I have written since then uh, little think pieces about emotional and psychological well being. And they have often had a sort of a a confessional nature to them exploring my own experience of that negotiation trying to be um, emotionally and psychologically well trying to find the right disposition uh, for life trying to position myself in the way to be most at peace with myself and there have also been pieces that i've written that have been a response to current affairs political situations but mostly they're of a generally psychological and philosophical nature um a sort of an existentialist bent and when i launched the podcast uh in may of last year it was really just taking that a bit further and using this format to to allow a bit more of a range of expression perhaps i've sacrificed some of the cogency of the um the 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 pieces i wrote on the website um but it has allowed me to indulge a bit more of i suppose a bit more of my sense of humor and a bit more of that side of my personality a bit more levity and has allowed me probably to to jump around with my sort of connected um my connected thinking um, where i sort of drag topics uh, under the yoke uh, of one overarching theme even though they might not at first seem connected but ultimately everything that's going on here it's all a sort of a, an exploration of they're, they're all explorations of wellness they're all explorations of resilience uh, explorations of coping better doing better living better and being trying to keep it real so the the subheading of the podcast is wellness with attitude and that attitude mostly takes um it takes the form of just trying to keep it real and call a, a spade a spade and not not be too precious and not be too po-faced and self-serious um and to just be and to not lose the ability to to laugh at myself and you know to laugh at ourselves the 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 collective the collective we we the human race humans humans of planet earth um so yeah so that's kind of that's 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 the gig isn't it if you're someone who's been listening you tell me 
you <laughs> you tell me what the hell I'm doing here because sometimes I just don't know I don't know how I got here I don't know where I'm going but um yeah that's that's the gig and I mean the other the other thing is from the website the the subtitle of the website is decluttering clarifying connecting and I think uh, I've continued to try and deploy that approach on the podcast as well to I'm a big fan of trying to <laughs> I'm a big fan of trying to simplify things and reduce things to sort of something fundamental or elemental I find I it helps me grasp things with greater success and organize my my thinking and my feeling around those things and for me the um that that's the that's the purpose of the decluttering separating things into their constituent parts and you know seeing where they're connected to other things i find that endlessly interesting and um i i just kind of i have a lot of faith in that idea that you know nothing is disconnected like everything is connected everything is a knock on a tangent everything is linked in some way there is no discrete way to live we um you know apart from that complete separation from existence uh from the everyday life the the hermit style thing which i suppose i mean that is a path that's a very that's a deeply spiritual path for some and there are times that feels very appealing I mean, I, I, I would argue, I would argue that there are aspects of that in how I live my life. And the podcast is an aspect of that. I mean, I don't use the word spirituality very much, but hmm, I don't know. There There is something about what I'm doing here that is that is an expression of, of I don't know what, of a... And again, this idea of being connected, it's an expression of something that's connected, something inside me, which is the the desire to make sense of things, which is also the desire to communicate. And that impulse connecting with larger concepts and higher thought, which is not to say better thought, but just contemplating, you know, the metaphysical. And that's where the kind of philosophical notions come in that's all in the mix as well now to me that can be there can be a spiritual aspect to that the sort of a an upward looking impulse um which is not just to say am i looking what am i what am i looking up at what am i looking up at up there is that a bird is that a bird about to go to the toilet over my head perhaps some say that's lucky some say it's just shitty you decide um speaking of birds the chickens are very vocal at the moment very vocal i don't know what's going on if it's just the time of year and the the sap is rising the rooster seems particularly active particularly uh particularly interested in his female companions regardless of their own level of interest and um if that's not a metaphor for uh you know, for uh, you know, established patriarchal structures. I, I, I don't know what is. Um, you can tell. You can tell by my tone of voice. I don't really believe that. However, I will tell you. I was, you know, my, my, my daughter was perplexed and frustrated. She's like, "Why is the rooster not leaving those chickens alone?" And I was like, eh, "Well, you know, maybe it's the time of year, spring. It's kind of the, you know, the baby making time." <laughs> Um, because the rooster is foisting himself on these poor, these poor defenseless chickens constantly. Um, it's very brief. It's a very, it's a very brief exchange. Uh, I, I will say. Um, but my daughter's kind of taken that notion, and now every time she sees the rooster running after one of the other chickens, she's she just shouts at the rooster, "Just you know, stop! They're not interested. They don't want to marry you." Um, so I'm just gonna let her. I'm gonna let her park it in that place it's a in her mind it's a it's a matrimonial pursuit there's um there's something lovely and innocent and that uh that lovely sort of ch- children they've, they've a lot of natural conservatism um 
Now you might say that's social conditioning, that's the stereotypes and the gender norms that are presented to them. Um, I, yeah, but I, look, there's time, don't worry, there's time. Every child can become woke given enough material, given, given enough time, okay? And so, to the, to the topic in hand today, now that I've finished uh, breaking down the, the podcasts, raison d'etre, I'm, just, I'm going to throw in a bit, a bit of French this week, okay? A few little bon mots. Uh, the raison d'etre of the podcast, that amalgam of missions, the mélange, if you will. <laughs> So I'm going to I'm going to melange um a couple of things in today's episode and I'm going to start with one of the big topics one of the hot stories from the world of the arts the world of movies yes I'm going to go to Hollywood not Hollywood County Wicklow which is not too far from where I live but Hollywood LA home of the American movie industry and of course, you'd have to be living in a cave like one of the, the aforementioned hermits with no Wi-Fi, no screens and nobody sending you up smoke signals or dropping off the daily paper. You'd have to be there to um, to not know what happened at the Oscars ceremony on um, Sunday night. The basically what happened, very simple very simple Chris Rock the comedian was uh, up on stage to present an award and he was just doing a bit of a bit of a spiel a bit of a a bit of slagging a bit of that kind of roasting humour that um, certain stand-up comedians feel obliged to do and it seems to be just the um, it seems to be de rigueur it seems to be the norm at these big uh, award ceremonies where if you're a comedian, you've got to throw some crap at the high profile celebrities in the audience. And um, in any case, I think pretty much in the front row or close to the front row in the in the um, the Dolby Theatre where the Oscars were held, we're sitting Will Smith, who the uh, the received wisdom was that Will Smith was about to be coronated that night with his first ever Best Actor award. And it was just seen. Uh, it was seen to, seen to be a sure thing. Uh, I think I referred to that movie that he's in, um, King Richard, about the the um, the tennis players Venus and Serena Williams, and how their father was maybe the driving force behind their their rise, their success. Um, you know, yeah, amazingly successful athletes. But anyway, and and apparently I referred to this last week. Will Smith gives a great performance i haven't seen it yet so i can't comment but that's the, that was the word will smith he's a he's a lock he's going to get the award for best actor so this was a little bit earlier in the night and chris rock was thrown around some some uh, some slags giving a few digs to the heads there and speaking of heads he looked at will smith's wife jada pinkett smith also an actor um and she was sporting a shaved head and I didn't know this, I only found out when I read the story. Apparently she has alopecia and she's spoken quite publicly about it and that's resulted in hair loss and so she's going for the, the shaved head look. Um, and you know, Jada Pinkett Smith's a very attractive woman and looked fantastic really. Um, and you know i look that's got nothing to do with anything really i'm just observing that that um for most actors in that world uh being conventionally attractive is is part of the deal you know there are very few physically unattractive actors or actresses who've had a long run um or you know actors who are not conventionally attractive uh, you might think of someone like Steve Buscemi has done very well out of being you know quite a you know quite a gawky unusual looking guy and he's, he's you know he's he's played it it becomes part of what you're selling um I mean Kathy Bates when she sort of really exploded I feel and I'm gonna you know betray my ignorance of her earlier career but it was in misery 
um, the Stephen King adaptation and you know again leaned into you know I'm not a svelte you know booby glamour puss um, you know I'm yeah I am what I am and this is what I do and she but you know Kathy Bates is a great actress as well so the talent will out that's that's the good the good part of that story anyway whatever so Chris Rock made a crap gag I mean it just you know it wasn't funny it was really a real obvious one and he made a reference to Jada Pinkett Smith's shaved head and basically said hey look forward to seeing you in G.I. Jane 2 so G.I. Jane if you don't know was a Ridley Scott movie is a Ridley Scott movie from almost 30 years ago in which Demi Moore played a woman who goes through US Marine training and she had to sport a shaved head for that movie Um and yeah there you go so that was the reference pretty weak gag and everybody laughed will smith laughed and then he looked across he saw that his wife was a bit stony faced and the next thing you know he's walking up on stage with a very kind of swaggery you know swaying shoulder kind of stride chris rock's going whoa what's going on here and will smith is not a small man chris rock is not a big man and will smith just slapped him hard across the face with an open hand and everyone was kind of stunned people weren't sure if it was a a comedy bit will smith has has you know fine comic credentials chris rock is of course a stand-up comedian um and people didn't know what was going on but then will smith returned to a seat and was roaring at the stage uh shouting up at chris rock to get his wife's name out of his effing mouth um and he shouted it out twice and yeah that that was the story so that was the story that that happened on sunday night and i remember when when i read the story first i was like oh my my honestly my first reaction was will smith is defending his wife i didn't think anything else that was my 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 instant reaction was oh okay i didn't know exactly you know the nature of what Chris Rock had said at that stage I just saw these kind of headlines and the social media headlines I didn't get the details and I thought okay so Will Smith is defending his wife's name or her honour um, and I thought I saw I saw that you know alopecia was in the mix and I thought well okay that's um, that must be tough enough for Jada Pinkett Smith and maybe it's not really fair to make a, a comment like that um you know particularly for a woman to lose her hair i think the 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 baggage uh, attached to hair is quite different for for men and women and i presume that hasn't been an easy journey for uh pinkett smith and i kind of thought okay i can see i can see that side of it and i wasn't i wasn't disapproving of that sort of sequence of events um and it was, it was actually well it was funny my um you know my my cousin here at hashtag blessed when i was relaying the uh, the story to him and he just thought his <laughs> his instant reaction was now this is all just woke woke madness um and you know hyper sort of preciousness um i didn't quite see the woke angle um but yeah certainly it was a it was a it was an extraordinary moment and 30 minutes later um will smith was presented with the best actor oscar for his his role in king richard and i haven't been able to bring myself to to watch his acceptance speech i read accounts of it and it sounded excruciating um very self-justifying and basically claiming he was kind of you know channeling richard williams and protecting his family and a higher power and being a was it a river for his people it was just hollywood jibber jabber and self-aggrandizing gibberish um and madness and then i was like okay now hold on what the hell has happened here um you know, and you could argue maybe Chris Rock just deserved to be shot down for making a crap joke. It just wasn't funny. 
Um, and then also in the mix is the fact that Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith, um, you know, have kind of have leaned in really heavily to using social media and other platforms to live, you know, an authentic life and to be very open and share a lot about their personal lives. Um, and so maybe uh, everything, you know, but maybe the feeling was there was, you know, nothing's off the table. Um, if you're living that much out in the public eye, so more than many celebrities do. Um, and, you know, Will Smith released his autobiography like a year ago. Um, and then, you know, maybe, and maybe that was all part of, you know, a, a plan leading up to this Oscar bid. Uh, who knows? Um, but ultimately, ultimately my conclusion was whatever about the you know the, the the reaction around you know the you know jada pinkett smith and alopecia and stress and the the baggage of you know a female beauty and the kind of the symbolism of a woman being forced to shave her head um i mean that's been used very effectively um and you know and kind of you know you know brutally in you know in in movies I remember there's a scene in, I think it's Black Book, the Dutch movie. Is that a Paul Verhoeven movie? Maybe not. Um, and it's set during the Second World War. And women who, it's at the end of the war, and in this town or village, the women who were known to have slept with the enemy, known to have slept with uh, German soldiers, were basically set upon by villagers and violently had their hair cut and their heads shaved and yeah it's very <laughs> yeah i mean it's a very effective scene and very confronting and the whole idea i suppose is to to hit them hit the women or punish the women um you know in that area that they were using to secure their their safety with german soldiers and to kind of take away their beauty and of course you know hair has that 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 symbolism um in fact here's a good one i remember years ago one of my girlfriends telling me that the you know that a horse's tail and the way it hangs around that shapely horse's derriere more french thanks very much um <laughs> you know that that is you know subconsciously that is stimulating for men because it's representing the female shape and the long hair and the voluptuousness of the female form as you look at the back of a horse. Um, I'm not sure I believed it then and I'm not sure I believe it now, but uh, that just popped in my head. Uh, certainly you can see the long, it's not the mane, it's the tail. That long tail could look like a, a woman's hair or a man or a man's hair. A man who has long hair. You know, look at those Vikings. Even look at myself back in the day. I had long, lovely, long, red, curly hair. Um, so there's that part of the story. There's also the story about violence, male violence. I mean, that's been a big, you know, there's no place for violence. Now, look, I, you know, I, again, I, I find myself returning to one of the, the themes that I can never quite put away um, on the podcast. And it is a reflection of the times we live in. But, okay, I don't think Chris Rock should have been hit. Uh, I don't think he deserved to be slapped. Um, but I don't think that there's a big conversation that needs to be had around male violence because some Hollywood celebrity slapped another Hollywood celebrity. Um I don't know. It's not, I don't. I'm not under the, under the impression that Chris, uh, that Chris, that Will Smith has a long history of violence, or a long history of punching or slapping people. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one time incident, uh, and you go, whoa, that was extreme. Now, you can, there's other, there's other, art, you know, other lines and other hot takes. Um, and other bits of punditry around the whole incident that it should have been a night to celebrate Jane Campion getting the best director Oscar only the third woman in the history of the Oscars to get a best director Oscar uh, it should have been a story about Ariana DeBose who plays um, 
oh my goodness, I've just gone blank on her name, Anita in Steven Spielberg's West Side Story. And she is a woman of color, as they say, so a, a, a black woman. Uh, she's also queer. Um, and so for her to get a the Best Supporting Actor Oscar for her role in West Side Story, that should have been a moment. And also the director of the best film this year. Uh, I can't, the film is called CODA, C-O-D-A, which stands for Child of Deaf Adults. Um, I think that's what it stands for. Um, I haven't seen that movie, but that was directed by a woman as well, whose name I do not know off the top of my head. So that was another take that we should be celebrating these great wins for, for women. Um, and, you know, for, for women, you know, who are representing particular, overcoming particular barriers, historical, you know, historically speaking or traditionally speaking, um, you know, much more difficult for women to succeed, much more difficult for women of color to succeed, much more difficult for a gay woman to succeed. Um, again, you know, so that, that is, I mean, that's not, a, that's not, not a story, but the take was, okay, well, no one's going to talk about this now. They're all going to be talking about Will Smith. And here I am talking about Will Smith smacking Chris Rock. Now, here's another thing to throw into the mix. And this feeds into Will Smith emasculating Chris Rock by choosing not to punch him. By choosing not to punch him with a fist, which is... You know, that's considered, this is how, you know, we'll go out and we'll settle this like men. And I'll punch you. We'll, you know, we'll have fisticuffs. You know, we'll roll up our sleeves and we'll get stuck in mano a mano. And uh, that is the historically um, honourable way to settle a dispute. But Will Smith slapped him. And that slap, I'm just going to throw this into the mix just because I'm stirring the pot in my melange. Um, some people call that a bitch slap. There you go. I said it. And there is a word. There's a term, a phrase that is. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't get much more misogynistic than that. It's so loaded with sexism. Um, it's, and it's a, it's it's a, it's a double. It's a double layer of sexism because one, you know, there's a name for this is how I hit women. So that's, you know, that's already an offensive idea. Um, and so I, I hit women um, with an open hand and I don't call them women. I call them bitches. And so you've got kind of there's a, you know, again, it, it's just layered. It's a very deeply entrenched sort of misogynistic language. And then to do that to a man. The idea is you're so I, I don't rate you as a man I don't rate you as an equal I don't rate you as a peer you're you're like a woman to me and so I'm gonna bitch slap you so it's just so then you can go whoa it's all representative of toxic masculinity I mean I don't really buy that again we're taking you take one incident and you project all that stuff onto it and you can say, but Dar, that's what you're doing. I'm not. I'm just trying to understand it and unpack it and explain it and contextualize it, which is not the same thing. Um, I mean, you know, I try to strip it back to should you be hitting anybody in the first place? Like is I have this conversation with my daughter all the time because she when she objects to something I do or objects to something I say, she likes to hit me. Very instinctively, very impulsively, she just lashes out and gives me a day. It's not, it's not necessarily very violent. It's not necessarily coming with a lot of anger attached to it, but it's an impulse she has. And it's partly, it's not, not partly, I mean, it's massively my fault because of the way my daughter and I play and we can be quite rough and tumble. And I like that. I, you know, I like her to be boisterous. I enjoy her being physical. Um, I like her to be a bit tough in that way um, and I like her being playful in that way it's a language I recognise and enjoy however I have been consistent um, in saying you don't don't use your hands when you're angry because um, I've done that and I'm going to put my hand up I've given my daughter a clip across the ear or the top of the head 
when you know I've just lost control and been angry or you know she's been particularly confrontational and I'm not saying that with any pride I'm not saying that with any justification I consider that a failure on my part and I've you know the times it's happened I've always you know I always try to kind of come back and own my my you know own that failure and own that loss of control and you know basically make myself humble um and contrite in front of my daughter to go I shouldn't have done that I regret doing that and I'm sorry about how it made you feel um and you know often it's 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 not necessarily the physical it's not necessarily like the, the physical force of that contact but it's what it represents and again like that idea of a slap I mean I've, I haven't had too much experience of this in my life being on the receiving end of a slap but I do remember vividly one time years ago I was in London staying with my late grandmother my mother's mother and she had issued instructions I was heading out into the city with I think my was my cousin from America uh, from New York was over visiting at the same time I think it was that year and for some reason he he mustn't have been staying with my with our grandmother um, but we were out and my grandmother had said look make sure don't forget your key you know don't forget the key to let yourself back in I don't have to come to the door um, you know she lived in uh, an, an apartment uh, a flat in in London in um, in Ladbroke Grove and it was, a, it was a great part of London to visit. You know, we visited regularly as, as children. My mother used to bring us over and used to always love going there. And still, you know, have very fond associations with that part of London. Ladbroke Grove and um, uh, Notting Hill and Portobello Road, all around there. Um, but in any case, I messed up. I forgot to bring the key and I got back. It wasn't too late, but that wasn't the point. And... I had to buzz and get my grandmother to come out and walk down the corridor and open the front door and she opened the door and she just reached out and she gave me a little slap across the face <laughs> and oh my god I felt so bad and it wasn't in any way painful I mean it was it was like being slapped by an old woman who didn't have much strength and that's that was what she was so it was like being slapped by a wet leaf. But I felt it in the pit of my stomach. And I just felt so bad and sort of shocked and ashamed um, by the sort of the indignity of being slapped across the face. Um, yeah, so that's that's one, you know, so the, the slap, it's a very... You know, and you think about it, you go back historically. I mean, that was how you would challenge someone to a duel. You'd remove your glove and slap them across the face with your glove. Uh, you know, you're throwing down the gauntlet. Now, for some reason, I think of a metal gauntlet and maybe, you know, we're talking about medieval knights. Uh, I didn't go and I didn't go and do any fact checking before, I, you know, before I pressed record. But we're in this territory. I mean, you know, the hand, the, the glove across the face. I mean, this glove that I use, what, to hold my horse, to hold the reins, to hold weapons. The glove that maybe gets covered in blood and filth. Um, I'd have to go back and do some research on that and find out what, it, I might have to return to that next week. Um, but again, the slap across the face, it's, um, you know, it's, 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 it's emasculating, it's insulting. Um, and that was, that was Will Smith's chosen weapon um, on the night. I'm just having a flash. I think I did get slapped by an, uh, an ex-girlfriend. Um, and another ex-girlfriend, actually. Another ex-girlfriend, a different one. She used to just, a bit like my daughter, used to habitually just punch me um, when she was a bit angry. And she she wasn't holding back. I didn't feel like I was getting... I didn't. Feel, I shouldn't laugh. I mean, I didn't feel like I was getting abused. But I used to kind of think, mm, this doesn't feel great. Just and but then that girlfriend did have a sort of a I don't know I was going to say petty she had a side to her personality um, that was that was in the kind of the petulant area 
um sort of a you know hold my breath and stamp my feet kind of vibe um and so it kind of fit uh i mean i I must say i was very fond very fond of that girlfriend um but in any case there was a different girlfriend i think as a prank i threw a glass of water in her face oh how we laughed not that funny i guess when i think about it now but i mean there was context and it was just you know it wasn't mean it was coming from a fun place but anyway i got a slap in the face for that one that's it i think that's not too bad is it two uh, oh my daughter i told you that one i'm sure i've told you that one before i'm pretty sure a few years ago in melbourne my daughter gave me an enormous slap in the face one time um because i wasn't listening to her and i was trying to i was trying to dry her after a bath and i was distracted i was thinking i'll get her i was trying to do the the evening routine i'm gonna get her into her pajamas and then i'm gonna make dinner and then i'm gonna tidy up and then i'm gonna do this and then i'm gonna do that and my daughter was trying to tell me something and i just kept on going no no in a second in a second and then she just pulled back and let rip and walloped me across the face and just said dada you're not listening to me as i said before where where was my karate then didn't help me i got knocked out by a a five-year-old um or maybe younger gosh anyway it was yeah it was a stunning little moment and i sent her to a room but a part of me was a part of me was i mean apart from being shocked and you know she'd never seen anything like that you know i'd never certainly there'd never been any demonstration of that action in our family in our household um but she got my attention (laughs) and i was quite proud of her on a level i was thinking wow that's very assertive um and i thought cool i hope she i hope she keeps a bit of that fire in her um but yeah that uh, yeah i just remember that one as well but anyway the i don't know where i'm going with this now hold on yeah so the 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 will smith thing then ultimately my feeling was this is a guy who is not keeping it together and this is what i find interesting about it and i referred to will smith as recently as last week and i've spoken about him before on the podcast he is not an actor i love i think he's a very charming presence on screen and has had a great career um in but but my resistance to him has always been i'd never i've never found him that authentic as a performer i've always found him playing cute playing a little bit kind of puppy dog playing you know lovable adorable please like me uh now you can you can put that you can put that into uh you can put that into a, a race context you can put that into a careerist context and you know i can put him with his wife and kind of go okay they're working it they've worked the game they've worked the system they're a power couple they're very big celebrities um and they're maybe going this is the way if we're going to succeed we've got to play it this way because we're black because we're african-american and it the rule book is different um and so maybe it's a career choice to go i'm not going to do these kind of roles i'm not going to say those kind of things i'm not going to live that kind of life and I'm going to lean into presenting this persona on and off camera. Um, and I can step back and go, OK, well, that's a choice. And, you know, he's absolutely entitled to make that choice. And they, as a couple, are entitled to make the choices they've made in the public eye to present this version of themselves. But I think really the lie are the pressure of all of that the pressure of those choices the pressure of maybe not living more authentically or not allowing this more complete side of the personality to be present i think it all 
exploded that pressure exploded in that moment at the Oscars the other night where Will Smith lost control and went up and slapped Chris Rock um, I think it's a symptom perhaps of living that celebrity life it's a symptom of being in Hollywood it's a symptom of having that persona and a symptom of 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 not being able to be real and I think maybe it, there's a lot of egotism there and there's a lot of Hollywood madness and the kind of the cosseted um, you know hyper aggrandized personality huge amount of excessive um, you know adoration and admiration and love and approval coming your way and believing your own hype and selling that persona um, at a cost and the cost is but I'm, I'm not being real and then being in the public eye about to have this big moment in your career 30 years of, of a career very successful and finally going to get that crowning achievement of an academy award for again what i believe is a very good performance um according to all reports and then just sort of losing all perspective in that moment and going ha ha yeah funny joke chris whatever and then going oh my wife's upset oh uh what should i do what should my persona do I'm going to go up there. I'm going to show this guy who's boss. Now, there might be, there's been a previous there, apparently. Um, Chris Rock has thrown a few digs, a few jokes at the Smiths in the past. And so maybe this has been building and brewing. Again, not a justification. Just giving you a bit of a, a backdrop there. Um, But I don't know. I just think that that, 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 that was a snapshot of a man who, yeah, was just hijacked by his own um, alter ego, and also I think it is like the persona we get is not the real the real person, and it all just got away from him in that moment, and then he had a very peculiar speech afterwards to try and justify it, um, and it was more madness, um, just. Yeah, mumbo jumbo, higher power, channeling this, channeling that, um, tears, emotion, and you're just gonna go. This, these, these people aren't connected to anything resembling reality, and by these people, I mean celebrities. I don't mean African Americans. Okay, so just chill the bones there, lads. Um, but okay, so listen here. This is where I want to take this, and you know maybe I've, you know, I, I apologize if this has been enormously boring. I didn't mean to to dwell to dwell on it for so long. But let me just drop this in now, right? And I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back. So my cousin here at hashtag blessed has had um, has had a bad experience with um, with the the COVID vaccine. He got the COVID vaccine last June or July and hasn't been well since. And the the bad vaccine reaction that many people have had fundamentally resembles long COVID and it becomes a sort of a an immune system uh, kind of syndrome uh, or an attack on the, the, the immune system where the, certainly in my, my cousin's case, the immune system just keeps overreacting to different things coming into the body and had you know kind of overcompensates and leaves him has left him depleted and very compromised physically um throughout the the the, the subsequent period so you know we're talking you know the last eight to nine months um and there's been better spells and worse spells but he, he had a bit of a a bad spell recently and went up to see a specialist and the specialist gave him a very generic uh, prescription um, which I was kind of amazed at but fundamentally the specialist was saying look I don't really know you know we don't know and you have to put it into the context of the the time frame and how much you know data has been 
collected, how much research has been done and what doctors are working with when they try to assess or diagnose someone presenting with these myriad symptoms. And the the prescription was so generic um, and nonspecific that it just almost felt like a placebo you know, prescription and a placebo kind of diagnosis. And so my cousin uh, presented the doctor with his take, which was, so basically, and this is the phrase he used, which I think is excellent. He said, so basically, I'm the diagnostic tool. And the doctor had to go, yeah, like, I'm going to, you to take this stuff, go away, see what happens and come back and tell me. Um, so, you know, my cousin's fundamental position is like he's a, a guinea pig and that they're using him as the tool with which to diagnose the symptom. And, OK, try a bit of this, try a bit of that. And then then I can check it, check it off the list or keep it on the list. Um, but I liked this idea um, of of being a diagnostic tool and this so now i'm I'm just you know i'm I'm leaving my cousin behind and he's, he's doing very well at the moment thanks very much um but i just thought this idea that you're a diagnostic tool of your own wellness so i'm not talking now anymore about a medical situation i'm not talking about that kind of i'm going to diagnose myself and give myself this medicine but i'm thinking more generally and more metaphorically that our pursuit of contentment and our pursuit of happiness and wellness in our lives is is the same idea that we're always our own diagnostic tool unless we've completely surrendered agency to a controlling person in our lives um, and surrender our personality our lobotomized ourselves in some way um and i mean that you could take that argument into many different areas um you know addiction comes to mind straight away uh denial uh the things we avoid um these pathological um you know these the, the, these pathological uh habits um or pathological structures that we bring into our lives because we're trying to avoid something or cope with something they're the you know they're the ways we sort of surrender agency but if we rule those out for a moment and go just this idea of i am my own diagnostic tool and all we do in our lives is try to apply ourselves somewhere or try to see where we fit and try to see what works for us to make us well. And in that regard, I think it's, it's a fantastic expression. The whole idea that this is what our lives are. This is what the life journey is. Uh, it's, it, it, it's for all of us. It doesn't matter, you know, what we're doing, where we're from, what our gender is, what our sexual orientation is, what our station is in life. The great human adaptation is survival. We find a way to try and make it work. We try and find it, you know, we find a way to to get through the next day. Um, and there's a, you know, the, the range of that experience uh, is, is endless, really. Um, there, there's almost no limit on what we can do to find a way through. And the, the, I was discussing this with my cousin the other morning. We were out for a lovely walk in the woods of the, on a those sunny days brought have brought very cold mornings but we were walking through the woods the other morning and i was saying like that 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 idea of the diagnostic tool i mean that the the classic example is someone who and this is just you know it's the clunkiest most obvious um a, a, you know example of this but it's it's someone who's maybe worked in big business or or finance for you know a huge section of their lives and has maybe amassed a huge amount of money and worked 60 hours a week and had the big holidays and all the rest and had the you know the lifestyle that attaches to that type of uh, sector and that type of income but they were never happy and they they pivot and they become a, a primary school teacher and they've never been happier and you just think how many of us 
are not able to work out what our best shape is. We're not able to work out where we fit. We're not able to work out where we can find the fullest expression of ourselves, which I believe is one very reliable uh, recipe for for wellness and a recipe for for thriving, for flourishing, um, to find that full expression of self, and like that to me is 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 the natural end point of being a successful diagnostic tool of our own wellness where we eliminate and this harkens back to last week's episode the you know removing things from the frame removing you know the empty spaces where we so where we eliminate the things that aren't good for us where we eliminate the things that don't allow us to be to be well um and that you know that i think is you know it, it, it's a fantastic um application of our energies and our efforts in life to go well you know what what is the best area for me to deploy what i've got and you know what's 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 the world i'm living in and what's it going to allow me to do and if it's not allowing me to do that what's the reason you know what's you know what what are my limitations in that area what are the obstacles um and is it an obstacle outside myself or is it an obstacle inside myself and is the outside world correct about not wanting me to go to that place uh, and recognizing how ill-equipped i am or understanding that actually i'm predisposed to something else entirely um I mean, this is this is something we can all struggle with, where we have a concept of ourselves that perhaps isn't that well aligned with who we are, and perhaps we're uh, a square peg trying to fit ourselves into a round hole, and we're we're convinced that the round hole is where we should be, utterly convinced, and we do everything we can to contort ourselves into the correct shape, which is pulling against maybe our natural our natural nature <laughs> is that is that a redundancy to to our natural nature today in natural nature um our natural leaning our natural setting um and so in that regard we we get in our own way and i think for you know for most most of us most of us earthlings you know most of us are living in a pretty you know recognizable or relatable or understandable knowable kind of you know life setting and the you know the range of of possibilities in terms of our day-to-day experience our existence are broadly broadly relatable so i'm talking about a very conventional sort of frame so even if arguably i'm doing something slightly less conventional the way i'm choosing to try and live at the moment you you know it it, it, there's nothing outlandish in what i'm doing like i mean teaching martial arts producing content for a wellness app doing the podcast doing a few other bits and pieces um you know it, it still all falls within very recognizable um you know within a very recognizable frame of of skills and application of skills what most of us can't relate to is being a huge celebrity being a kind of superstar so i think when you try to be a diagnostic tool in a world that is full of extremes in a world that is full of um you know full of people who are you know constantly perpetuating a sort of a you know a myth of 
of success of of hyper achievement um and packaging it into a a very aggressive positive um persona you know the the, the shiny happy people of the movies um and we're, and we're talking yeah we are talking about hollywood after all um this isn't some kind of indie sector um you know where people are you know making movies for 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 scraps and i mean you know even that's a bit bit of a strange thing to say because your average indie movie is not made for peanuts anymore i mean that they've said they've got budgets that would make your your eyes water but it, it's all it's all relative because we're not talking about some humongously expensive superhero movie um but in in any case that world of uh, of celebrity is it, it's it's it bears no relation to a reality that we could recognize now that said i mean it, it over you know over the last 10 15 20 years maybe maybe longer the the advent of kind of reality tv and you know shows like um meet the kardashians um was it meet the kardashians why do i want to say keeping up keeping up with keeping up with who keeping up with whom um meet the kardashians um the the, the meet, meet the, was it was it keeping up with the kardashians and meet the osbournes was that it oh christ i don't know like there was the ozzy osbourne show as well these are you know la hollywood lifestyles you know the mansions there's been a proliferation of those kind of shows um following you know celebrities around following wannabes around following you know tryhards following you know b list c list d list former celebrities all that kind of thing we've had much more exposure to it girls of the playboy mansion comes to mind as well so in terms of what we've consumed the content we've consumed or been exposed to we actually do have a bit more of a sense of of the madness we do have a bit more of a sense of the the, the distance between you know them and us i suppose if you want to put it that way um the normalcy of our lives and the the insanity of theirs and of course it's all part of you know the cell and it's all part of it's it's all fed into a sort of aspirational lifestyle uh, and social media has has fueled that you know that kind of delusion or fueled the fantasy and allowed people to do their own sort of you know bespoke presentation of an aspirational lifestyle um and you know again i i feel that that that's there's a, there's a, there, that, that 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 i feel that that world can be very fraught with you know false expectations and false presentations that ultimately can be very damaging to our our wellness um and to our our sense of what's possible in our lives and um, that idea of comparison being a very dangerous element um in in the wellness frame uh, rather than focusing on ourselves what we can achieve in our own lives our day-to-day wins our day-to-day wellness when we're living in a world where we're focusing on the hyper successful and the hyper famous and the hyper celebrated and we equate that with something that is attainable where we're and you know where we're basically going there's an, an equivalency between that life and our life and where we can get to it's um it, I think it's very damaging. And so if you think of, of that context then of the Hollywood celebrity machine and Hollywood lifestyles um, and you go, that's Will Smith's world. And the Oscars the other night, you know, those first three, four, five, six rows in the theater are some of the most successful people in the history of Hollywood. And um, certainly in recent years. Um, and that world is not our world and how how can you be an accurate 
are a credible or a reliable diagnostic tool in that world where you know it's all conditioned to to keep aloft this you know the, 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 this this shiny um facade of hyper success and and wellness you know you know wellness in a kind of a shiny package of of charm and beauty and perfect teeth and perfect physique and um you know the big mutual love in so i mean it's all brought into sharp focus in a, in a big award ceremony like that uh so how can you be a an accurate diagnostic tool in that environment um and so what you know what was going through will smith's head the other night that's the point can will smith diagnose himself you know accurately can he get a really true read on where he is on who he is on what he's doing um and i would say if you're using the slap as an indicator of of wellness and an indicator of this is a man who's in a good place in his life you'd have to kind of go nah, no i don't think so this is unhinged behavior and the you know the speech backs up my theory <laughs> of unhingedness um so anyway i mean if you want and look i tell you what one thing you could read and maybe i'll throw the link in with the uh, in the description hadley freeman the uh, journalist who writes for the Manchester Guardian, The Guardian. She's American, but um, writes for The Guardian. I think she's in London, you know, England based. And she she always she kind of covers a bit of the kind of celebrity Hollywood uh, territory. Uh, I think she's good. Like she's a fan, but, you know, she's also able to laugh at herself um, and certainly able to laugh at the celebrities. Not snarky, can kind of see the just can see the fluffy you know madness of it all but she did a nice piece on how no one was willing to talk about the slap in one of the you know in the party circuit after the oscars but she finally got a little bit out of the actor jesse plemons who um jesse plemons is he's one of those really interesting actors and he falls into the category of not being conventionally um dreamy or dishy or hunky or spunky he's um kind of he's kind of um rather innocuous looking and a bit doughy and dough-faced but he's kind of brilliant he was great and kind of chilling in the uh in the tv show breaking bad as this you know shockingly and unexpectedly uh scary sociopath um kind of like this baby-faced young guy who was capable of the most dreadful things uh he was also brilliant in the i think it was the second season of fargo playing opposite kirsten dunst um they're um they're a couple now shout out to kirsten dunst i've always been a fan always been a fan ever since interview with the vampire i thought this this is a talented this is a talented person and so it's proved they both appear in Jane Campion's Power of the Dog. Um, and in any case, Hadley Freeman got a hold of Jesse Plemons at one of these parties. And he, he, his take, he was trying to put it into context. And I'm just going to quote, I'm going to quote directly from the, um, the, the Hadley Freeman article. Because uh, he said that... He said, yeah, we were pretty close, he said, referring to himself and his fiancée, fellow nominee, Kirsten Dunst. At first, I thought it was a joke. Then when Smith was shouting all those swear words, I thought, oh, maybe they'll bleep those out. Uh, and then I realised it wasn't a joke. And yeah, it was pretty weird. And here he pauses. I'm not quoting. Um, that's, so here he pauses and he says, back, I'm quoting him again now. He says, but you know, all this, he said, gesturing around the party, is pretty strange. And everyone's feeling so riled up and strange. And everything's kind of nuts. 
So maybe it kind of made sense, you know? And that's what Jesse Plemons said. And I think he's, in you know, very few words, quite succinctly saying, it's all madness. This is, a, this is madness. This, Hollywood celebrities, an Academy Awards party, the high point of the year for Hollywood movie makers. And in this world of madness, maybe Will Smith getting up on stage and slapping uh, a comedian and getting back down and just, you know, swearing at him from a seat. Jesse Plemons is kind of saying, well, in this world, maybe it kind of fits because it's all madness. It's all nuts. And so then I think that backs up what I'm saying, you know, within, you know, you, you, you can only diagnose yourself in, in the world in which you find yourself. And so if everything's mad, what else are you going to come up with? You're going to come up with some, you know, related diagnosis um, of madness within that world because you've no other reference points. So, uh, so there you go. I don't know what kind of a conclusion that is. Not a very satisfying one, perhaps. So I don't know. What do we do? We keep it normal. We keep it real. We keep it authentic. We don't put too much faith in personas. You know, what is a persona anyway? You know, it's a projection. It's it's something that actually distances ourselves from who we really are. So it might be protective. Um, I mean, I think generally that's you know that is the case. Um, it's it, it's one way we try to protect ourselves. Um, so, and you know, in a world of you know celebrity exposure and paparazzi and fanaticism and um you know endless scrutiny you know maybe you know there is there's an argument there that yeah of course why wouldn't you want to protect yourself why wouldn't you want to come up with a, a formula that goes this will keep me safe this will keep the real me safe there's an argument that well just don't play the game don't play the game and maybe if you're a celebrity like will smith who puts himself out there constantly that's a it's a high risk strategy um and I think I think really what you saw at the weekend was it can backfire badly um, when you lose control of when you lose control of the game or you lose control of how you want to play the game and you've just lost that frame of reference that kept you safe. Um, I think that's I think really that's my my take on it and all the other all the other stuff you can draw out and reflect on however you choose. Um, I don't think the implications are as dread and severe and somber as many might think. I think it's just a a celebrity who lost the plot for a moment. And, um, you know, on he'll go. On he'll go now with an Oscar in his back pocket and probably enjoy a long career. Because I'm certainly not saying for a millisecond that anyone should be cancelled. Okay? Let's... let's, let's Let's give up the old cancelling, lads, will we? Let's not be cancelling people. Let's just talk. Let's just reflect. Let's just kind of work things out with a bit of intelligence, uh, a bit of self-awareness, a bit of humility, a bit of honesty, maybe. Maybe that's maybe that's a way forward. Or else just mind your own bloody business. Yeah, no one needs to know. Live your own life. Okay. There you go. That's not bad, is it? Let's let's leave it there. Okay, we're done. We're done. We got through it. Congratulations. As always, you can. You can send me some love on social media. And somebody did. Esther, if you're listening. <laughs> Esther, if you're listening in Copenhagen, thank you so much for your, your lovely your lovely thing you put up there on Facebook this week, sending a bit of love to the to the podcast and to me. I'm 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 very appreciative, I can assure you. Uh, so it can be done, folks. It can be done. If you want to spread the love on social media, you can do so. The Clear Out Podcast on Facebook, the Clear Out Podcast on Instagram and on YouTube, the Clear Out Two on Twitter. And if you want to send me any responses or suggest topics for discussion or movies to be discussed you can do so on those platforms or at the clear out live at gmail.com and 
if you want to support the show financially to support this independent podcast which i really enjoy doing and which i hope will be sustainable in some ways in the future uh, you can do so using the supporter link in the description wherever you're listening to the podcast or you can become a patron and make a regular contribution to the show um, at the link patreon.com forward slash the clear out and i'd be grateful i'd be grateful for whatever you can do so there you go we're done you uh you take it easy keep your hands to yourselves certainly keep your hands to yourselves if you're angry and um go well travel well take care mind yourselves and i'll talk to you next week all the best see you bye